Welcome to Understanding Epidemics, a Many Model Approach. My name is Scott Page, and I'm a professor at the Stephen Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. In this video, we're going to talk about curve fitting models, and we're going to focus in particular on the IHME model from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. The IHME model was developed by Chris Murray and his team. This is a model that has been incredibly useful in guiding action, federal action, state action, community level action. It's been able to do so by making predictions about the number of ICU units needed and the number of hospital beds needed and the number of fatalities. The IHME model is a curve fitting model that differs from the SIR model which had micro foundations. Let me explain the difference. In the SIR model, we placed people in three categories, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And then we made micro level assumptions about how people moved from susceptible to infected and recovered. And we got a pattern from that. In a curve fitting model, what we do is take existing data and try and fit that data to a curve or a line. So in linear regression, we might have a bunch of data and we try and fit a line to that data that best expresses the data that shows the pattern. So this particular line doesn't do a great job of fitting the data. If we look at the data for fatalities or look at the data for number of cases, or look at the data for hospitalizations with respect to the coronavirus, we see the curve has this very sharp upward turn. If we fit that to a mathematical function, we see that it fits an exponential curve pretty closely. But we know the data can't fit an exponential curve forever because it can't just continue to go up and up and up. So let's go back to the SIR model, right, which has infected and susceptible, number of contacts, spread, recovery rates. This model, which has micro foundations, tells us something about the shape of the number of people who get the disease over time, which is this yellow line, which is S-shaped, and the number of infected, which will be single peaked. We can use that baseline knowledge have a better understanding of what type of curve we're going to fit. So we don't want to fit an exponential curve, such as the one we see on the left. Instead, we want to fit something that's called a logistic curve, which as we see on the right, is an S shape. Now the mathematical function that represents a logistic curve, so it tells us f of t, this is the number of cases at time t, or the number of fatalities at time t, is going to have the following functional form. It's going to be some number m over 1 plus e, which is Euler's constant, which is 2.71828 raised to the power minus g times the quantity t minus c. Okay, that looks super complicated. What do those variables mean? m is just the maximum value. That's the total number of cases, total number of ICU beds, or total number of fatalities, depending on what we're trying to estimate. c is just the center point. That's going to be the day when we're kind of right at the middle of the process. And then g is the growth rate. Think of that like r0. That's telling us how fast the disease is spreading. The bigger G, the steeper the S curve. Now the question is, when you try and fit this sort of curve, what data do you use? And you might use the number of cases. However, we haven't had much testing, and so the case data isn't going to work. We could also use hospitalizations, but once again, we don't know if people who have the disease have necessarily gone to the hospital. So the best data at this point is the fatality data because you've got a good clean count of the number of people who've suffered fatalities and you can infer how many of those are the result of the coronavirus. So what the model does then, and this is from the state of New York, is it has daily data of the number of fatalities and it tries to fit that curve that the best it can. So the solid line is the data to date and the dotted line is what the model predicts will happen in the future. The shaded area is the uncertainty about what may happen in the future. Let's go back to the logistic function. If there's interventions, if people quarantine, if we shut down non-essential businesses, that's going to push that curve down. So when we're fitting the curve, we have to do the following. We have to sort of take into account what we think the effect of policy is going to be. So how does the IHME team do this? They draw the red curve, which is what's going to happen if there's no interventions. Then, as a baseline, using data from Wuhan province in China, two regions in Spain, and five regions in Italy, you predict what will happen if there are interventions. So this is kind of like a best case scenario. Then you ask, what are the possible interventions that might happen? School closing, non-essential businesses, stay-at-home orders, travel restrictions. 
The model then says, what if we have one intervention? That'll move it down a third. What if we have two interventions? That'll move it down two thirds. What if we have three or four interventions? That'll move it all the way down to the blue line. What the model does is assumes the red line until we have interventions, and then the blue line after we have interventions. So if you look at the IHME model for number of fatalities, you'll see that then it sort of flattens out and it makes some sort of prediction. The shaded region is the area of uncertainty because the model doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. One of the great strengths of the model is that you can apply it to data at state and regional levels. So at the state level, in figuring out when the peak will come. So this is the graph for New York, and it says the peak should happen about April 9th. This is the graph for California. It says the peak should happen about April 27th. Now there's a question you might ask. You could say, well, isn't it the case, if I think of this model within the lens of the SIR model, that what's really happening is that we're just lowering the effective reproduction rate over time? That's absolutely correct. So let's go back. Remember we had the basic reproduction number, R0, that's context times spread over recovery. That's what's kind of driving that red curve. What's driving the blue curve is the effective reproduction number. Are we lowering the number of contacts? Are we reducing the spread? So what you can do is you can try and estimate RT, the real-time effective reproduction number. And what you see if you look at New York, and this is worked by Kevin Seistrom, you see that it's gone down in the last few weeks of March and early April. So it's gone down from a level of almost 3 to 1. And as it goes below 1, you're going to stop the spread of the disease. So takeaways. What do we learn? First, these models are very useful for policy. You can predict the number of beds, the number of ICUs, and the peak. Not exactly, but imagine trying to do this without a model. Imagine trying to do this without fitting this to data. Second, the curve fitting tells us if our effective reproduction number is less than one, are we stopping this from spreading? And if not, we need more draconian measures. If we are, we can start loosening things up. So this is, again, this sort of threshold or this tipping point for whether we're stopping the spread or not stopping the spread. And then third, these estimates are going to improve over time. And that's going to happen for two reasons. First, we're going to have more data. And with more data, you can fit a curve more precisely. And secondly, as we move to the flat part of the curve, it's easier to predict. Let's see why. Let's look at this yellow curve, which is the total number recovered. When you're right in the thick of this, when that thing's really steep, if you've got your estimates a little bit wrong, you're going to miss by a whole bunch because there's so much slope to the line. Once you're in the flat part near the top, as the epidemic slows, there's less possibility of a major increase, and so your predictions are going to be more accurate. And what you see, if you look at the predictions from the IHME model, early on they predict 100,000, 90,000. But in the last week, it's hovered around 60, 61,000. So they've become much more confident in how many fatalities we're going to see in this first wave of the pandemic. Now, are there shortcomings? I just hinted at one. The first is, is that this model is only estimating the first wave of the epidemic. And this is why we need a many model approach. So let's go back and look at some of the other models we've already studied. The expected fatality model. That tells us the number of fatalities equals the population times percent infected times the fatality rate. So let's just do some simple math. If we get 60,000 fatalities in a population of 333 million, and let's assume a fatality rate of 0.6%, if we sort of multiply that through, we get that the percent infected is going to be only 3%, maybe 4%, 5%, but a very small percentage of the population. Let's pull up another model, the SIR model. What the SIR model tells us is, is that susceptible people become infected and then they recover. If 4%, 5% of the population has already got the disease, we're removing them from the susceptible pool, so that's going to shrink, but it's still going to be incredibly large. So there's still a huge set of susceptible people that can become infected, and we're absolutely going to get a second wave. The difference is, if we think of this green line as the number of susceptible, we're pushing that down. So each wave should be smaller than the previous wave. In addition, if we think of our network model that we covered with Abby Jacobs, if we can do things like contact tracing, what we're going to do is reduce the number of contacts that infected people have, and that's going to reduce R0, which is going to make second waves, third waves, even smaller than the first wave. So as effective and wonderful as this model has been, it only estimates the first wave of the epidemic, and we need things like fatality rate models, SIR models, network models to help us with subsequent waves. Second, it's not appropriate for policy evaluation. It doesn't tell us whether we should open the economy by region, whether we should open it by industry, which industries. 
because there's no micro foundations. What it can tell us as we do these policies, how well they're working, but it doesn't help us in the design of the policies themselves. And third, and this is kind of the big one, which relates to the other two, because there's no micro foundations, we can't look at sort of what individual level actions are going to do. So how well will contact tracing work? What if we can self-quarantine better by risk factors? How much will that reduce fatalities? These are key questions as we move forward from a policy standpoint, and this model isn't really suited to help us understand how well those are going to work. We need models that are more computational and have micro foundations at their core. So as we move ahead, as we try and design policies, take wise actions, it's going to mean that we need to explore, and that exploration is going to involve a richer set of models that make more micro-level assumptions. We'll cover those next as we continue our many model approach to understanding epidemics. Thank you very, very much for listening. Hope you and your families and communities are doing well. Wish you the best. Thank you.